be made whole. And so a lot of people's life pursuit is that. It's just to enjoy more, consume more, do more, um, and hope that one day they're going to wake up and have it be enough. And this is blind faith, right? Because no one has ever woken up and gone, yep, I nailed it. I'm completely content, and I, and I, I have true happiness. Um, but I, it is amazing how many people, I mean, it's, it's, our, it's our natural fallen inclination is just to continue on. You say all different types of people, but you just you, you see some people like Paul was, where he was bad, and then he, he became totally good at everything. Then you see people that are born straight, Yeah, I think there, there, there's a couple of things I just unpacked there, but I, I think one is that Paul would never say he's perfect, right? All of Romans 7 is him saying, you know, Romans 1 through 6, he's just displayed what God has done for him. And then Romans 7, he goes, holy smokes, I do the thing that I hate, yeah. right? So I, I think that's an important thing, right? That even in this side of the Jordan, this side of glory, right? where you're still going to be struggling against the old man, right? Um, so there's, there's that aspect of it, right? So that means, I think that's good news, because that means that um, uh, we're, we're not as not as bad uh, uh, as we necessarily think we are, or at least we're not unique in our struggle against evil in ourselves, right? Um, but you know, I'm sure Bridget would say a similar thing if she was in this room, right? Um, Bridget would say, I'm not perfect, right? That humbleness is, is always a great sign of someone Who's, who's walking the righteous path, right? Um, none of us are made good by that. We're back to, like, literally, we're going to be talking about today, right? Uh, so, uh, Bridget, Bud, John, me, we're not made good by the moral actions we do, right? So, not cursing, not being intoxicated, not doing those kinds of things. Uh, those aren't the things that make us good. They are evidence of a goodness that resides in them, right? Um, and that's an important distinction, and one that a lot rests upon. So uh, uh, we've been kind of talking a bit uh, as we wait for people to trickle in, but I think we're going to have to get started here in order to get our whole lesson in. So let's begin with a uh, quick prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump right into uh, Article 12. Okay. Let us pray. O God, who makest us just glad with the week for the remembrance of the glorious resurrection of thy Son, our Lord, vouchsafe us this day such blessing through our worship of thee, the days to come may be spent in thy service, in the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. <coughs> so today, we're going to be looking at, uh, in our series, Why We Ain't With Him, we're going to be looking at specifically Article 12 of the 39 Articles. So that's on page 605, 605 of Book of Common Prayer, and I will read that for us quickly. Again, another short article, but very much appropriate for both our discussion on Article 11, last week's discussion of James 2, and today's discussion obviously in Article 12. So let, let's read this. Albeit that good works, which are the fruits of faith and follow after justification, cannot put away our sins and endure the severity of God's judgment. Yet are they pleasing and acceptable to God in Christ, and do spring out necessarily of a true and lively faith, insomuch that by them a lively faith may be as evidently known as a tree discerned by the fruit. The beautiful article, actually. What's interesting is this article was not part of the original 39 articles drawn up, the 42 articles, drawn up, uh, or sort of edited by, uh, and drawn up mostly by uh, uh, Archbishop Cranmer. Um, these were, this one was actually added in under the, uh, 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 the authority uh, of Archbishop Parker, who is the Archbishop after the Elizabeth gets to the throne, right? So what this is designed to do is it's designed to clarify the position of the Anglican Church on its understanding of good 
you can see, particularly in its spot after Article 11, that its job is to really emphasize um, the importance of good works, right? The good works aren't a thing to be ashamed of. They aren't a thing to be avoided. They are the natural outgrowth of a lively and true faith. This is important. Why? Well, let's start on our journey, and again, you know, it's important, we're going to talk a lot about sort of very scripture that speaks in congruence with this article, but it's important for us to kind of start our journey on kind of, has this been a constant problem in the church? Um, have people who believe in the shocking good news that it is Christ's merits which justify us and not our works. Is that shocking good news been something that's elicited a, shall we say, strong reaction from people in the past? Right? And, we, and we see that actually already in Romans 6, which begins here. St. Paul says to his sort of imaginary interlocutor he's talking to, right? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? The question is, if you know, God's righteousness is shown through the death of Christ and through the, all the sin he's forgiven, then now that that's done, should we just keep sinning, right? We're free. Let's go sin all we want, right? We're, we're free from the constraint of the law. The moral law is not the thing that saves us. Christ is, but why can't I go now sin? So it's obvious that this is a question Paul had gotten before, because he puts it, again, Romans being the later, one of the latest of his, uh, of later of his writings, probably after 20, 25 years of ministry, um, is sort of the, the, uh, the best example we have of what we could call Paul's understanding of what it means to be a Christian. Here we have this question, are we continuing sin that grace may abound? Of course, it's a rhetorical question, but it then goes on to answer it. Of course not. We, we aren't to sin. He said, you know, God forbid, let it not be so. Um, why? Well, because not only are we not called to continue to sin, uh, we're called to do the exact opposite. We're called to do good works. Uh, we're called to now go out into the world and be the, be the way in which the world sees the love of God. I mean, Jesus said this, right? What does he say in Matthew 5.16? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Right? So, if, you know, Jesus has this understanding of calling himself the light. Right? He is the light that's come into the world. John puts this so beautifully in his prologue, and then it's a theme that comes back again and again. The idea that Jesus is the light come into the world that is, in a sense, against the darkness, and the darkness fights the light, but the darkness doesn't beat it. So you have this sense here of the regenerate Christian, the born-again Christian, another great phrase our Lord uses, that when they are now sort of a ambassador of the light, right? so you go out into the world, and when we do good works, this light shines into the good world, into the world glorifying our Father, which is in heaven. Um, there's a sense in which, uh, again, I think this, this idea of kind of being an ambassador of the light is a beautiful idea. Kind of, kind of imagine what happens then, right? So when we go out in the world, we represent the God who saved us. We represent the Lord who has made us free. Again, not free to do whatever we want, but free to do good. Right? Free to be the servant of good, right? The servant of Any questions on that? Yeah. Mark. How can you keep yourself from sinning? <laughs> How can you keep yourself from sinning? Excellent question. question. Um, so, as Paul again will say in the very next chapter, right? This is chapter 6, number 4, 7. Right? As Paul will say in the very next chapter, you know, I do the thing that I hate. I fight this battle within myself. Um, part of the struggle of being a Christian is that we have this redeemed part that still is sinful, this side and this life. That God in his infinite wisdom 
has been thought it fitting that we have this struggle now, right? That, that, that the sense is that we will face uh, temptation, we will face testing, is what Peter will talk about, right? This testing we will face in this new life. Why? Because it's making us holy. It's the, our fight against this is the way in which we are growing and holy. If, if, if there's a sense in, good morning, good morning. If there is a sense in which we just sort of went to bed one night and were tempted to sin, and then woke up the next day and no longer had any temptation to sin, we would lose out on this time of being privileged to fight against evil as Christ fought against. Um, and the problem is, though, of course, as Mark, you're right to notice, that we are going to lose that fight on a week-to-week, day-to-day basis. Right? So we sometimes we fight and we win, sometimes we fight and we lose. But so much of what this struggle is about is that we're not in it alone. We have the Holy Spirit with us at all times. We're with the body of Christ, with the, the people of God who are here to help us. And we have to take that seriously. If we didn't have an enemy we were fighting against, including an enemy that lives within our own hearts, then would we need to be together? Would we need the sacraments? Would we need the ordinary grace of the church to help us through our lives? No, we, could, we would probably just be on our own somewhere, hanging out, not worrying about things. But in a sense, there's a, there's a beautiful way in which Still being wounded means we have to trust in God more, trust in his church, trust in his people, right? Again, if you were just healed totally, you would not have that part of your life. You, would, you, would, you, you, you wouldn't feel that, you wouldn't have that, that desperate need to be with the Lord this side, this, this, this side of, of, of death, right? Um, now, the hard part of that is to always remember that there is no condemnation now. That's what Paul says. There is now, in Romans 8, the very next chapter, there is now therefore no condemnation. Well, wait, how can there be no condemnation if I still fail? Well, it's because my failure is not the thing that condemns me uh, or saves me. It's the merits, unmerited gift of grace of God, right? That saves me. Um, so what happens is, as John says, as John says in his epistle general, is then we are then called to repent our sins, right? To go before the Lord to the throne of grace and mercy and repent our sins and say, God, I'm turning away from this part of my life. Help me and fight me. Again, the fight is part of it. There's no sense here in which the, the struggle isn't a tough and terrible but beautiful part of the Christian life. There's no, there's no getting around that. When, when we talk about, when the book of Revelation talks about tribulation, um, that tribulation. Um, is what you are going through now. And you are being tested and prodded and attacked by the forces of evil. And the good news is, as we read in Philippians, as Paul says to the Philippians, the good work that God has begun in you, he will see through to the end. So my next question Please. will be... Uh, not to no, no, you're fine. The questions are great. <coughs> tribulation, that we're living through tribulation, so there's such thing as tribulation that comes at the end of the world really doesn't exist for living through tribulation now. I, I think the, 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 the big point that you know John is trying to make when he's talking to the churches of the time, to the churches that will come after him, to the churches that will come, come after us, right? That the church will always be under tribulation. Now, at the end of the world, of course, there will be tribulation. It might even be a bit worse, right? Or hard, you know, uh, sort of, that's kind of a relative thing. I mean, the tribulation feels pretty bad if you're in, you know, Syria and ISIS is crucifying you. 
right? That feels like pretty bad tribulation. That, is it like a step up above being crucified by the Islamic State? I mean, that feels pretty bad, right? So for them, that's that's it. Nailed it. The tribulation's happened. For us, we have this, I mean, too often we can have this kind of idea that um, we're not under tribulation because that's happening over there, or there's some super future tribulation that's going to happen. That is absolutely not the case. Our fallen world, our fallen uh, 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 Western world is just as, just as much under tribulation, just a different kind. Right? A tribulation that asks us to sell our souls for garbage. Right? That's everywhere. Right? That asks us to give a piece of ourselves to be part of you know, horrors like, uh, uh, like abortion or drug abuse or all the things that are literally killing people and ripping people apart. Right? Uh, that's tribulation well, so it's really important for us to recognize that and fight against it, and know that that's our particular war that we're fighting now. And we're going to lose that war sometimes. We're, we're going to be compromised. But we pick ourselves up, we go back to the throne of grace, ask for forgiveness, and get back in the fight. Right? Uh, until the day we die. Until the day we die. And th knowing that the victory is already assured. This, this is in a sense in which we can lose. That's, that's, the, that's the tragic irony of this. There's no sense here in which we can lose because our victory is the victory of Christ. Right? Christ has already won. Christ took the worst the world could take given, the cross, torture, took that on, had the, not only that, the wrath of God placed upon him, and survived. Right? Not died on the cross, rose the third day. Right? Made it through all that. Victory over. So our victory is his victory. So there's no sense here in which we can lose. And it's not like it's this it's not like the devil might have a really good day and win. Win win one. No. He's already lost. That's why he's raging, as Revelation says, right? Like, you know, woe to the people of earth who are here now who have to go through this tantrums he's throwing, these rage fits he's throwing. Right? When we look out in the world and see it just ripped apart by evil and sin, that's the rage this Fits, this rage that's happening that we are being buffeted by. Um, but that's okay because we know Christ has already won. We can make it through. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Any other questions on that? That's a, those are big stuff. Again, all questions are fine. Please keep them coming. All right. So we talked a little bit last week or, or in the week before that, kind of this is sort of the theme we're going for these next three weeks about the idea that. Uh, St. Paul and St. James are sort of against one another in their understanding of justification and their understanding of the works of the law, the works of the law and things. And that's not the case at all. Again, we mentioned last week that they are sort of working against two different types of errors, right? The error of antinomianism, the idea that uh, uh, anti-lawism, that there's no law we have to follow now now that we are saved. Um, and then, of course, legalism, the idea that I am saved by doing the law. I'm saved by doing the things that are my duty. Both those are errors. And they're, the, the, the two men are attacking those at different times and different ways, trying to make sure we don't lose sight of them. But I think sort of the best example of kind of the, uh, the marrying of these two concerns in one section uh, is in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We have this kind of magisterial statement by Paul um, to the church in Ephesus. So here's what he says, of course. Um, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Period. Do such. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So you have these two sections, right? So you have the, the idea here, and, and again, of course, our, our, our punctuation and things are a new addition, but it's trying to help us better see this idea. But we have this idea here that how we are saved is through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God so that we can't boast in our works. Um, and then what's the... The reality that comes out of that good news 
is that, that we now know that we are a thing of workmanship, a thing created by Christ Jesus. For what purpose? Unto good works. That we now have a new purpose in life. Right? A purpose no longer to serve ourselves, but to serve God. Right? A purpose to serve God. And then, incredibly, just in case we start maybe getting a fucked up head about this, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So even the good works that we then flow, right, that we do, right, you're doing the good works. You don't do good works by thinking about good works. You go out and do good works. That even these good works which flow from the new life given to us by Christ, that these good works are ways in which God uses us ordained before time. Right? So there's a sense here in which it isn't even as if, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, we can sit back and say that, well, you know, it sure is a good thing God has me to help him out in the world. So I'm going to sit here and make up my plan to save the earth and, and do stupid things. That even our minds, our intellects, our hearts, our, all of us, that is now directed toward God, all of us now it, are operating on a plan that God has before. Like the ultimate Rube Goldberg. <laughs> well, so, right. Yeah, so John meant like a Rube Goldberg machine. So like, like it does a very complicated thing to do something simple, right? Like it'll like flip an egg or something. Like all these things have to happen. Um, it is in that except, strangely, it's been said, you know, it's, it's hard for us to know. We're being a bit speculative here. But it's entirely possible, like, I forget, that this is the most efficient way in which this is to happen. Yeah. Right? Like, like so, it's a reverse of Like it's like a reverse of a Rube Goldberg machine, like, right? Um, yeah. So I think it's very, very important for us to keep those two ideas in our heads, right? Now, what's fascinating about this, too, is that this ordained works that God has us do, none of this robs us of a participation. Right? It isn't as if our participation in good works um, are meaningless because God planned them from the beginning of time. God saves us. God puts us in the position. Right? The actual doing of them has real meaning and real wonder and beauty and goodness. That, that's, that's something we can't take away, away from that. Uh, it's, you know, so, that. Sometimes people compare these kind of ideas that, well, if God knows I'm going to do this before it happens, does this rob me of the thing value? And no, that's not true. I mean, that's, that's even true in our own lives. Um, I think of uh, 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 I think of something that. Uh, so, say for instance, in my own house, I, as most men, it's my job to take the trash out, right? Um, and I do it the same time every single week because I'm a creature of habit. Now, I wouldn't. My wife knows that's a thing that's going to happen. Um, but even when it happens, it isn't just have to tell me to do it, she doesn't have to worry about that. When it happens, it isn't as if she goes, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. You do it every week anyway, so who cares, right? Or I knew that was going to happen. It doesn't really have any value. It doesn't matter, right? Of course it matters. Of course it has value, right? Um, now, I would be a fool, though, to uh, uh, say that it was solely me and solely my own goodness that caused me to want to take the trash out. No, right? What's all What's all wrapped up in that? My love for my spouse, love for my home, love for my children. Uh, the love becomes the motivation for doing good works. That's the really key thing here. We don't do good works because we are afraid of God. Uh, there's only so far that will carry us. Um, being afraid of something, you eventually become not afraid of the person, but afraid of punishment. That's re the reason why the vast majority of people follow the laws of their community are not because they necessarily love their community, it's because they're afraid of getting caught. Right? If those laws were taken away, or maybe they stopped being enforced, what would happen? Anarchy. Right, I mean, anarchy might be people would just do what they want, right? Um, because it isn't that they have some kind of deep-seated, necessarily, love for that thing. It's because they don't want to get caught, and they don't want to go to jail, right? 
I mean, a good experiment could just get rid of jail when people keep following laws. Yeah. Well, there'd be some people maybe who would follow most of the laws, but how many people in here have sped this week, like in their car? <laughs> Yikes, don't you love your community? <laughs> Why did you do that? Well, I didn't think I was going to get caught, right? No, there's not a cop everywhere. But, uh, you know, I'm not saying you're the worst person ever, but I'm saying, ooh, yeah, that's there. That's the thing in my heart I didn't <laughs> Uh, that's that's a lot. What about some else? What if you could, you know, take money out of the bank and nobody, nobody, nobody's guarding it? Right? Maybe I will. Maybe I need that money. Right? Okay. But that's the point here, right? Um, fear is not a very uh, At the end of the day, fear is not the best motivator for having us follow the law, particularly the law of God, particularly when the consequences are so seem to be so far away, right? Well, I mean, God's going to judge me, but, I mean, that could be like 40 years, 50 years, 10 years, right? So I can put all that aside, and I'll worry about that later, right? Fear, very limited there. But if I love God, right, if I recognize that God has given me everything, God has saved me, and now out of my love for God and my trust in Him, I now do good works, well, that's everything. That's an entirely different way. It's the way in which, as Paul is saying, that we can now do the law. Not because we're afraid that if we don't do the law, we will be smited and destroyed, right? We do the law now because we love the lawgiver. We love the creator, right? We love Jesus who saved us by perfectly following the law and being lovingly obedient to his Father. And so now we pick up our cross and follow Jesus, right? loving every step of the way. Our works become an expression, the ultimate expression of our love for God, right? Because every time you have to sacrifice yourself for something, that is the expression, that's the way people know you actually love. It's the sacrifice of ourselves, particularly when it's a sacrifice that is non-reciprocal. Right? There's no sense in which we're going to get anything back to. Um, so when you do good works for God, it isn't so that I will get something back from it. Right? It's, it's not at all. Um, it's not as if we're appeasing God, right? Because that's, that, that's the same thing as if we built a little statue and started making sacrifices to it. Right? It's a very old way of trying to appease the God, make him happy, make him not smite us. Right? That's not this at all. That's not Christianity. Right? You're not trying to appease God. I'm trying to, 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 to make him happy so he won't hurt us. That's not what's happening here. That's pagan religions. That's all of it. Um, even the sacrificial system of the temple, right? You say, well, isn't that what's going on in the Old Testament? Well, we hear again and again that you know, Jesus, God says in the Psalms, do you think I need your bullets? Do you think I need your, your lambs and your cattle? I don't need that. All the cattle is mine. Every bull on every hill in the world is mine. I don't need your stuff. Even in the Old Testament. So here we are now, where there is the one sacrifice for sin has been made by Christ on the cross. Do you think he needs? Right? There's a great scene in my favorite Star Trek movie. Star Trek 5, I think. I think it's 5. Um, where, where they think they found God, and he says he wants to use Captain Kirk's starship. Captain Kirk says, why does God need a starship? It's a great theological question. He doesn't. And so this thing's not God. It's a great QED. Anyway, God doesn't need need that stuff, right? So then why you know, so so then, then why does God require these things from us? Right? Well, it's because we need it, right? It's because we need it. It's because when we when we do stuff like tie, does God need our pittance? Does God need the widow's might? No, He doesn't need that. But the widow needs it. We need it, right? We aren't doing God a favor by giving, by, 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 by being part of his church. <laughs> That's, that God doesn't need us, right? But he, he lovingly allows us to be a part of this great fight against evil that he has already won and allows us to be part of the victory. Now the question is, are we insane enough to go, eh, I don't know if I want to be part of the victory. I would rather be part of this losing battle against against God that's going on around me. 
And that's, a, that's an easy choice to make because so many people around us have already made that choice daily, constantly, right? And, and we're called back to that choice, right? And, and the glorious thing about the gospel is that we don't need it. We're freed from it. Paul constantly makes this a connection between being a slave to the world So if we can hold these two ideas together, really these kind of two sentences as they are in the King James Version, this idea of being saved by grace through faith and not ourselves, but that by that we are now the workmanship of God, we are now his new creation to go out in the world to do good works. Right? Our purpose is that. Our purpose is to do good works over and above everything else. Right? Uh, over and above everything else. Basically, what it means is our every action should be a reflection of that purpose. Um, and that, again, we don't want to be limited in that, right? So you know, when you think of good works, we oftentimes talk about uh, uh, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Right? Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Um, that's a massive part of it. But we don't want to limit that from all the other aspects of our life in which we can be working for God. All the other aspects of our life which we can be working for God, right? In our daily work, right? In the way we use our hands, the way we use our time, right? The way we use our leisure. Is that a thing that's working for God or not? Is a question that should constantly be on our mind if we are assured of the salvation that comes to the gift of God. We essentially, as Paul says in Romans 12, and as we say every week in our service, because God has gifted himself to us, because God has given himself for our salvation, we in turn give ourselves as a living sacrifice to him. <coughs> Total, our whole self. All right. So, that brings us to uh, Galatians 5, 6. Where we get a sense here of, of what exactly Paul is talking about in terms of when he says... You know, it, it, the works of the law don't save us. So, in Galatians 5, 6, For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Again, we have this understanding here that it is, and this is an enormous thing to say at this time period, right? He's saying here that the old covenantal seal the old seal of being the covenant people, circumcision, is not the thing which saves you. It's not the thing which saves you. But faith, which worketh by love. Faith, which is shown to the world and shown to us by our love for others. Again, not love as the fallen rule would define it, but love as God defines it. So how does, how does God define love? What does God say the greatest love is? Great quote from John 15. <coughs> greater love hath no man than to give his life for his friend. Greater love hath no man than to give his life for his friend. So in our, in our understanding of where love is, right, we have to recognize that there's already been told what the greatest love is. And of course that's what Jesus does just a few days later when he dies on the cross friends and as the cross for us. Interestingly, not uh, people he was connected to uh, just by sort of blood or tribe or anything like that, right? Um, there's a sense here in which that friend idea extends out beyond that. Right? Um, and so our calling then to understand how does it look like for our faith to work out by love is that is then defined by how God sees love as a sacrifice of ourselves for others. Um, this is hard though, right? Because it's easier in our mind, what we, what we really usually would like to do is sort of to deny all this and sort of fall into one of those two camps of legalism or anti. So, 
the comfort of being a legalist, which there are a lot of places around us that are very much in that way, the comfort of it is, is Mark, as you said earlier, you know, what do we do about sin? Like, how do we stop sin? The comfort that comes from legalism, it's a false comfort, is that we take the sins we do and we line it up next to all the things we think God owes us for that we've done, and we hope the scale. And if you, you can kind of in your head, like, well, I went to church, uh, I stopped at that red light, I brought my neighbor's paper to her door, and you kind of work your way down the list. And then maybe your thing is, um, I don't know, I stole $300 from my work. You kind of go, oh, I mean, that's one thing. And then I've got all these things over here, so I must be on the right side of the ledger. Right? Um, and Paul says that's nonsense. Just as James said last week, right? If you've broken one part of the law, you've broken all the law. Right? That's nonsense. Not, none of that works, right? That's always a death sentence. You start working out that, that logic. And again, any sin we throw on that list is always going to be troublesome, right? Any sin we throw on that list is going to be troublesome. Um, and there's another side of it that says, you know, it's, it's flattering to think that I'm the way in which I save myself. This is particularly flattering um, for Westerners, right? There's a sense in which sort of built into our DNA is the idea that, you know, I'm the captain of my soul, the... the, 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 the the one who has fate in my hands is myself, right? No one's going to tell me what to do, right? No one's going to save me. The person, like, for instance, who's the hero of a story? The person who saves someone or the person who gets saved? No one goes, oh, it's the person who gets saved who's the hero, right? So if that's how so many stories in our imagination are, it's difficult for us to then sit back and go, well, I'm the damsel in distress. <laughs> No, I want to be. I want to be the hero, right? And the hard thing about the gospel is again and again, the whole Bible, again and again and again and again, as it says, we are not the heroes of this story, right? We are not the heroes of the story. God is the hero. Specifically, in this case of our salvation, the one who saves us is Jesus Christ. So we have to make peace with that, and that's hard. I get that. I mean, we, that, that's always been a struggle in understanding, in understanding the gospel. I am not the person who saves. God is. Now, blessedly, he allows me to get in the, in, in, he allows me to join the Knights of the Round Table and we go off and we go, to, go, go on to victory, right? Um, you're just never going to be King Arthur. Right? <laughs> that's, just, that's, that's never going to be you. And that's okay, because there's lots of other seats, right? You can be, all, you have lots of spots to fill. Right? But you're never ever going to be King Arthur. Uh, uh, and it's also really never ever going to be a round table either. Sorry. That's, that's a, but there's a sense in which, you know, I, I, I suppose, I don't want to get too, 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 I was a little bit hard on that. If we think of the idea that Jesus calls us co heirs with him, the idea that we are going to rule with him in the new heaven and new earth, I mean, there's a sense there in which perhaps I was a little bit too quick to sort of <coughs> make a joke, make a crack on the round table. Um, I, I think you could, uh, you could definitely see that as, a, as an idea um, uh, of what's kind of we're moving forward to, right, in the new heaven, new earth. Uh, but, go ahead. It would be a round table with him in the middle. <laughs> that, that, that sounds pretty horrible. How would you even talk to anybody? You'd have to, like, spin around a whole lot. Uh, anyway. But no, I, I'm with you. Uh, but no, uh, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's there. Uh, so, yeah, so I think that, that, that's, a, that's a, a really key idea for kind of understanding that um, our works in this life are motivated and find their reality in love. I right? love the act of loving. I mean, I think this, this is an interesting thing that sort of we sort of feel, unless we're psychopaths, I mean, you sort of have this sense of people talk all the time about that they live for love, right? Oh, I live for love. Like, I, you know, or people say this in kind of popular songs or in popular life, like, oh, life was about love, right? You gotta have more love in your life. Uh, what was that dumb book? Eat, pray, love, right? There's a certain sense in which people have this kind of sophomoric or kind of blind groping for this truth that's out there, right? Um, there's a sense in which we long for this reality, even if we don't know it perfectly or don't know it fully. 
And the glorious thing about the gospel is that it's, it's the square peg that fits the square hole. It's the truth that, that, that's revealed to us and made real that you know, satisfies that longing. Right? Um, it's incredible, right? It, 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 nothing makes sense like that. Um, nothing curious in this way. All right. So, last, uh, last couple of things. Um, let's take a quick look at Luke 17, 7 through 10. Um, Luke 17, 7 through 10. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke 17, and uh, I'll read it too, so it's on the, Luke 17, um, 7 through 10, it's called in the, uh, there's a, a heading on it in the ASV, Unworthy Servants, um, Luke 17, 7 through 10, you can read on with the neighbor if you'd like to, no worries, uh, but I'll read it out. This is, uh, of course, our Lord speaking. Will any of you who has a servant, plowing or keeping sheep, say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me and dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Uh, so when we think here about, you know, sometimes you hear people talk about, well, we're out here building the kingdom of God, right? We're the ones doing the real work here. Right? Um, this is a very helpful corrective to our pride, right? That when we do good works, or when we, yeah, when, we, when we do good works, it isn't as if we are not doing the thing we're supposed to be doing. Right? So if my daughter came up to me and said, I was a really good girl today. I didn't steal any cookies. <laughs> well, that's good, but that's baseline your job is not to steal. Like that, do you want, I mean, because she's a little kid, I mean, she's little, like, I can go, oh, that's a good job, good job. But would I do that to an adult? You know, if, 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 if I said to my wife, sweetheart, I was really good today, I didn't steal any cookies, but she'd go, great job, buddy, you, you did it, you, you did it all, here you are, you're the best, let's have a, let's have a day for you. No, she'd be like, good, you didn't steal any cookies. That's your job, right? What's wrong with you? Right. Um, and, and that's kind of the Christian life. <laughs> that's not, I mean, Jesus literally said, this is the, the, these are all things about what the kingdom looks like. I mean, when we do, you're, you're, you're supposed to love others, right? That's the law. Like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's your job. And when you do it, you don't get to go, yeah, we're ever have perfectly. When you do it, you don't get to go, yep. Look at me, I did it. Now God will sure is glad he has me and can reward me. No, no, of course not. You know, that's your job. Congratulations, you did the bare minimum, right? Um, that should be our attitude towards this much more than look how great I am, God owes me, and so now I can go sin, or how is usually how that works out. Uh, or now I can get a day off or something. I don't know how that works. I, I get a cheat day on loving God. No people get a cheat day on loving God, right? Um, every day we are called to love him and love our neighbor. Um, blessedly, our eternal salvation is not held up by that, so that if we screw up one day or curse at somebody in traffic, we don't immediately, the ground doesn't open up and we don't get sucked into hell, right? That's good. But the idea that because you didn't curse the people in traffic, you're, you, you, you're, you're the best Christian ever is just not the way this works, right? You go, thank you, God, for getting me through another day without cursing at the morons who drive in Orange Park. Right? That's, 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 thank you, God. I appreciate it. Help me to not do that, right? Um, I, I know that's a struggle in my life. I don't know about everyone else's. Uh, but uh, one of many, one of many struggles. Uh, all right. 
So, this, the, so we're talking about uh, our final our final note is to uh, uh, talk about this in terms of our of our our prayer book. And you know, this class is bi-weekly, and it said why being Anglican. And one of the great reasons is, is that we are constantly sort of enriched by the liturgy that drives us to see this truth about good works. Um, so one aspect of this is uh, in the Order of the Holy Communion. Uh, if you turn to the General Confession on page, uh, excuse me, to the General Confession on page 75, and we get this, we say it every week, but sometimes these things can be, can be hard for us to, 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 to hone in on. Um, so after we confess the horror of our sins, the intolerable burden that they are, we then say, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy son, notice we don't say, I did all this good stuff this week, now have mercy on me. No, we say have mercy. The mercy is all God's to give. Forgive us all that is past, and then, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of God. This is an expression of this idea. Um, grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life. That we walk away from this confession and absolution, that we walk away from this ready for a new life to serve and please God. So what do we say after we're done communing? So after the administration of communion, when we have literally uh, uh, and, and, and spiritually been united to God, um, through Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we say on page 83 in our thanksgiving, and we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Again, <coughs> assist us with thy grace that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. So the consequence of communion with God, with the communion of saints, with, with the fellowship with the communion of saints, the consequence of our communion is that we now go out into the world as assisted by the grace of God to do good works. That's the, the consequence of being here. So again, that gets back to our question, what are the ways in which we are strengthened for this fight? Um, a, the fight is necessary, like we talked about, right? The fight is needed. That we need the fight in order to drive us together, in order to drive us to the throne of God's mercy, to drive us to the sacrament. Right? We need the fight, the struggle against sin in our lives. Um, and then when we're here, consequence of being here together, a consequence of being in God's house, being in his church, and being united as a church, um, is that we are then empowered to go out into the world and actually do the good works God has ordained for us to do. It's a beautiful thing. Um, it's a beautiful aspect of our service. Um, it's one of those things that uh, the service is trying to teach us, right? It's a, it, there's a teaching function so much of our liturgy. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's obviously as a, a function of praise and worship, but it's also a function of teaching us how to think about God, how to think about our lives. Right? It's built into it. It's why it's super, very, very necessary. Um, it's something that can't be dispensed with. It's why when uh, churches try to liberalize, to become progressive, the first thing they attack are the texts of worship. They change them. Right? Because they recognize that if you, that is how people learn about things they say again and again and again and again. The ways in which they are catechized against the outside world. So it's not a surprise that that's how, when churches change, that's the things they change. They change the words. They change the text. Right? Change the way we talk about them. Um, but lessly, God doesn't change. <laughs> so, uh, and if our liturgy is, as we see, just these two small examples, is the way in which we draw the Word of God into our hearts, the way in which the Word of God is written into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, that we recognize that this is a thing that we treasure and a thing that we hold on to. Um, okay.
So you'll find many other, there are a number of other examples of this, of this doctrine within, within our service um, of the importance, again, of constantly recognizing that we are justified by faith through grace. And as a consequence of that justification, we are now empowered to do good works in the world. We've been given purpose. We've been recreated to go do good works in the world, which is going to lead through our sanctification, through our, our, our the pursuit of holiness, through our being made holy, that we can be the glorified people of God, uh, quite literally, the, uh, so we can be like our older brother, our co-heir, so, our, our, so we can be co-heirs with Christ. That's coming. That's what this whole process is about. That's what this fight is about. Okay? Question? They, uh, <clears throat> they took there is no health in us. Yes. Out. Right. So uh, in, the, in, <clears throat> in, in, in the confession of, 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 of sin, um, in the uh, morning evening prayer, um, the, the phrase, there is no health in us, was taken out. Right. Um, in the, for instance, the Seven Nine Prayer Book. Um, but also you'll see this in other, other modern liturgies. Um, so the idea that sin is a burden, that will usually be taken out. The idea that we're miserable offenders is another thing that gets taken yeah, out. Like, the idea that we are, there's no health in us, that gets all taken out. Uh, because we want to believe that I can, I can do it myself, I just need God to help me. And what we find again and again and again is that's not the case. I am desperate and evil, and I need not only to be helped, I need to be reborn. I need to be recreated, regenerated. I need to be a new person in order to actually follow the law. And that, blessedly, is what <clears throat> Christ through his spirit offers us. First, of course, in the waters of baptism, okay? the regenerate waters of baptism, as we say in our service, um, and then moving on through the church's process of through word and sacrament of changing us, making us, uh, of having us grow in holiness. That we need that more than we need anything else in the entire world. We need that more than we need food and water. That's 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 the truth of it, right? More than we need school, more than we need anything, hobbies, glasses, clothes. We need that because all those other things will pass away, and the only thing that will be left is is uh, is, is a holy people worshiping God. So our, our, our focus has to be on that. That's hard in a world that tells us to focus on everything else. And it tells us to focus on everything else on purpose. Uh, it's trying to make us believe in a different religion. Other questions? Good, good question. Thoughts? Concerns? All right. Oh, but go ahead. I saw a nice thing on Facebook. It said I was reading my favorite book, and the main character in my book died. And then the next one said, but that's okay. <laughs> Because he uh, was born again in three days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really sad. It takes a dark turn, right? Blessedly, uh, uh, he, 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 he's resurrected. Indeed, yes, yes. I, I like that. That's funny. Uh, uh, that happens a lot in movies and books, though. Uh, people constantly rip off the Gospels uh, and their stories. Uh, uh, and sometimes you'll see that as, 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 a, as sort of a, a trope. Uh, um, a, a hero gets defeated, uh, maybe not necessarily die. Because uh, the resurrection is still sort of scandalous, um, but then comes back and perseveres and wins, and that's that, that's that's pretty that's a very common idea. Um, blessedly, uh, the Bible and the Gospels are still pretty wild in that very wild, in fact, um, in that the idea that you're you're to see your hero go through something so gruesome as a crucifixion, uh, an, an act of humiliation. Right? It's actually a little bit more than most stories will go. Um, I kind of think it's a way of showing the power of God. Of course it is. For us to see that. It is. And, and also for us to see that God is with us in suffering. Right? That suffering isn't a cosmic joke. God doesn't laugh when we suffer. He doesn't think it's funny. It's not like you have like, some torturing gerbils or something. God, God takes suffering very, very seriously. We ask for suffering through sin. And he says, I'm going to solve suffering by uh, sin by suffering with you. Right? That's incredible. It's like when you say coming to church. And uh, it's, to, to me, it's a way of bathing in the glory of the Lord. Yes. It's rather than, I, I know it's, I need to be forgiven. Sin, sure, of course, of course. But, but doing that.
Yes. No, the, 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 the cross is simultaneously this horrible event and the greatest thing that's ever happened, the exaltation of God, the showing forth of his love and righteousness. And he sort of catches on that when we talk about Good Friday, right? There's a sense in which there's, there's, uh, there's a blackness and a darkness and the, and the evil of it all. Uh, but it is also the great showcase that proves God's love for us forever. Um, and so then we can love him in the way he then tells us to love. Good, good point. But thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. Uh, if you have any more questions on that, um, feel free to send them my way, uh, and we will.